God. It's my honor to be here. What a testimony. Amen. Amen. We heard, I can't, I know that, I'm sure that you probably already testified at the camp. They make everybody go through the testimony. <clears throat> I would have been there this year, but I was already scheduled to be somewhere else. Hate that I missed that. But uh, so glad I got to hear your testimony, man. That was wonderful. There's no telling. That's just the beginning of where you are. You're not a sinner anymore. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You still have a sin nature. We all do. The Bible, when you're born again, never addresses you again as a sinner. Amen. We're redeemed by His blood, transformed. All now, brethren, saints, that's it, children, belong to God. Amen. We still have a nature that desires, uh, uh, you know, flesh, a flesh sinful man that still will have desires for things, but that don't mean we have to do them anymore. Amen. It broke the power of sin, the dominion. I, I don't sin. I don't have, you don't have to sin a little bit every day. Come on, somebody. Amen. The power of Jesus and his blood sets you free from having to sin every day. Absolutely. Amen. I sinned every day when I was a sinner. I don't sin every day anymore. John said, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. He didn't say when you sin. He said if you sin. That means you don't have to because what's born in you is made of righteousness and true holiness. He that is born of God cannot. That means there's a nature that come to live inside of you. When you're born again, a life comes in you created in righteousness and holiness. It cannot sin. And if I live out of that new man, I don't have to sin. I don't mean I won't. That don't mean I have but I can tell you this, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But I want to tell you what, you don't have to. Amen. You don't have to. There's power enough in, the, in Jesus and the whole, His Spirit that He gives us to overcome. We're overcomers by His blood, by our testimony. Amen. Thank God. You just got to deny that old nature that wants to gravitate back toward old things. Amen. Just keep Him dead. And you do that simply by letting the life of Jesus live. Feeding that nature now. Feed that new man. Don't give him that... What, what, what's his name again? Holden. Holden. <laughs> okay. Where was you from? Hupper. Holden from Hupper. I knew I was getting another thing. thing. <laughs> well, Holden. Amen. Well, Holden, listen to me, man. Now, this is for all of us. You don't have to go back to that old music, man. You just bury that stuff. You just give that somebody. You know, don't even give it. Just throw it in the trash. Amen. Just get rid of that. I put a whole about 300 CDs. I spent a lot of money on that stuff. But I tell you, I got born again. I knew I didn't need that anymore, Joe. I knew I didn't need that stuff anymore. And I tell you what, if you keep it, you go back to it. Right. Hey Amen. I felt that pull. I knew finally I had to get rid of that. There's nothing good there. Amen. Amen. I just want what glorifies Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I didn't know nobody ever preached that to me. But a new life came in me and said, you don't need that anymore. Amen. Amen. I didn't know what I was going to do the first weekend I got saved. I went to go rent a movie. Came out there with some kind of a cartoon or something. Because every time I went down an aisle, something in me. Nobody's with me. Didn't have a pastor with me. Didn't have nobody with me. But Jesus was with me. Amen. He was in me. And every time I'd reach to pick up something, it said, well, I failed in my... I just something said, well, you don't need that. And you don't need that. And you don't need that. I don't remember what I come out of there with. I don't even know if it was anything. But nobody ever preached that to me. But a new life said... To go here. Don't go there. He lives through us by His Spirit. Praise God. Amen. What a testimony. Probably going to be a preacher. You never know. But that's God's business. His calling. But I'm amazed at how God orchestrates how He reaches men. Amen. What a God. He'll go a thousand miles out of the way for you. Amen. For one. That's how much He loves you. Praise God. Turn with me in your Bibles tonight. It's good to have my family with me. For those of you that are visiting, we are, we are evangelists. This is what we do. 
This is our life, my wife and two children over there. My son Peyton, seven years old. <laughs> my daughter is going to be eight months old this weekend, I think. Such a precious little gift. She wasn't with us last time we were here. Last year, well, you're right. Yes, she was. I keep saying that. She was with us, but she was in her mother's womb. But she's out now. Amen. And she's as, as precious as you'll ever lay your eyes upon a little girl. God gave us that little girl in the hardest time of my life. God gave me a blessing. Amen. Folks, He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. He will not fail you. Amen. He will not fail. Look with me in the book of Luke. I, well, I, actually, matter of fact, in John. I'm going to go to a couple of places here this evening. Amen. Thankful for the Word of God tonight. I want to ask you, as you get your, your Bible out, if you would stand with me, just kind of something I like to do. <clears throat> There's something special about coming to the time of the Word of God. Not trying to be religious or anything. We have little customs and things in Pentecost too. But not that we're bound by those things. But just sometime, you know, you just like to stand and say, you know what? The Word of God is taking preeminence over all of what is being done here. It's kind of a break in the line. And to know that everything has prepared us for this moment. We need the Word of God, folks. Amen. It's obvious. People just don't have the understanding. It is a biblically illiterate generation. And God said, my people perish because of that. Amen. There's some things that if you don't know can cost you. So we want to know everything God wants us to know. Look at John chapter number 5. And verse number 25, we're going to go to just a couple of places in John. I'm not going to preach long to you. I'm just going to preach till I'm through. Amen. Is that okay? Amen. <laughs> All right. Verse number 25, John chapter 5 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. They that hear shall live. Now look with me at John chapter number 11, verse number 43. And when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44 says, And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with the napkin. And Jesus said to him, Loose him and let him go. Oh. Now I want to give you one more verse, just back one chapter in John 10 and verse number 10. I know you could probably quote this, but I just want to take it for a text tonight. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Loose him and let him go. That's what I want to preach under the thought tonight. Loose him and let him go. God's release into life more abundantly. 
Help me pray. Father, thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the testimonies. Thank you for your presence in your people. Thank you for liberty. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for the Word of God. I ask you to anoint and to bless everything that's done here. Convey the truth of the message. I pray and we'll give you glory and praise for it. In Jesus' mighty name, and the church said, Amen. Amen. And you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. And we are in His presence. Amen. Praise God. Now, I'm not going to go too far into detail here, because I'm probably certain that most of you are very familiar with the story of Lazarus. And even those that from a young age in Sunday schools or whatnot have learned about the story of the man that was dead for four days and came back to life was quite a miracle when you think about the fact that a man could ever come back from the dead at all, especially after he'd been gone for four days. Now, while you might be familiar with the story, I want God to take those things that are oftentimes too familiar to us and bring a freshness to it and bring a newness to it so that we can see that we're in the Word of God. And often Oftentimes we take for granted when we're in a familiar place in the Scripture and that we know very well that we have exhausted every bit of revelation and understanding concerning that. But I want to tell you that this Word of God is a person who is inexhaustible. And you might be in John 3 and 16, but it can speak eternal realities and depths beyond anything that we could ever know because you and I are going to spend eternity learning about the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a book about Him, but it is Him. Every word, every jot, every tittle, every scripture is God-breathed. And I want to tell you that it's Jesus. He is the interpretation of all of the scripture and the Holy Spirit is the interpreter. It's a spiritual book written to spirit spiritual man and can only be understood by the Spirit of God. Now, I want you to note that tonight, that you can't know this in a natural understanding. You have to be born again. You have to have the Spirit dwelling in you. And if you're going to have fuller revelation, then you're absolutely going to have to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. But I want to take you back into this time with this man. And I want you to just reimagine for me a moment how really powerful of a miracle this was. For by four days had went by, if your loved one was gone, that most likely by this time you would have had a funeral, you would have had a visitation, you would have had some fellowship with the family, maybe a meal or something, but by this time you've already had the graveside, you've already buried him in the ground, put some flowers upon the tomb, and a days go by when all your family's gone off and all your friends and only those that are closest up to that person are remain there left to pick up the pieces or to grieve for the loss of one that was so close. And after all of that had taken place, can you imagine after you said the goodbyes and the finality is totally there completely, six foot down under the ground with dirt covered it up, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here comes Jesus on to the scene when you think it's all over and done and out of the midst of it all he calls this one that was dead, he calls his name and he comes back to life. I mean I want you to imagine that folks. Can you imagine the shock and you can you imagine the awe on the day when Jesus called Lazarus' name and he came forth out of a grave and back into the realities of life. Think about it. I don't I don't know if you're getting this. <laughs> Four days dead. And he came back to life. I want to tell you 
that there's nothing ever in your life so dead that God can't bring resurrection out of it. Amen. 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 Resurrection is God's business. It's the thing that only God does. You got to do a lot within yourself. Man can do a lot of things and accomplish a lot of feats and, and do wonderful things in life as long as he has breath in his body and as long as there's a beat in his heart. But the moment that that expires, man's business and greatness is done with. But resurrection is God's alone because only he can bring back what was done dead to life again. Come on, somebody. I want to tell you something here tonight that God is able to resurrect the deadest circumstances, the deadest dreams, the deadest hopes in your life and He can bring those back to life. And Lazarus was dead for four days and he got the attention of a world because he that was dead came back and came forth back into life and that is a miracle that only God could do. I want you to know that last things are lasting things. And there's a reason why that Jesus, whenever he did perform this miracle, that he waited into the time that he did. It was the final work of his miracles before he entered into the week of the passion, before he would up ultimately be raised himself from the dead. But he's demonstrating to those who followed him before their very eyes so that it would be fresh upon their minds and press in their hearts and press in their spirits that he that was dead will live again. And he wanted to demonstrate to them the impossible. He wanted to bring their faith to a place that it wasn't yet. They believed he could have healed him. They had faith that if he would have been there that he would have made it. He would have been healed. But they didn't have faith that he could raise up the dead. So so he waited until the fourth day till all hope is gone. Why? He wasn't toying with them. No. He's going to increase the measure of faith in their life. He's going to let them know not only can I heal the sick, but I can raise the dead. Hallelujah. When it's totally hopeless, when it's totally buried and gone and laid in darkness, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me Though he was dead, yet shall he live. And he wanted it to be fresh upon the minds of those apostles for them to know them disciples at the time, for them to know, listen boys, I'm going to die on that cross, but I don't want you to worry because the same God that raised Lazarus will be the same God. It will raise me up by the word of his power and I will live forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you give God praise, church, for his reality of resurrection in your life? Amen. It's a wonderful story. It's an incredible testimony of the man who is dead coming back to life. I've been down on the inside of the tomb where Lazarus was put. But you know what? That was his first tomb. Amen. Because he's a man with two tombs. Hallelujah. Not too many people could testify of having two graves. But Lazarus can testify. He's a man that was buried twice. Amen. Because the first time he came up by the word of the power of Jesus. But let me tell you something here tonight. As great of as a miracle as it was for Lazarus to come back from the grave. You and I have entered in the same way. Out of the same testimony. You might say, Brother Jeremy, I don't have Lazarus' testimony. Sure you do. If you've been born again, just like Holden, he's got the same testimony as Lazarus here tonight. Because Ephesians 2 and 1 says, And you has he quickened, who was dead in trespasses in sin. Hallelujah. Every one of us here tonight was a dead man. We were buried in a grave of darkness. We were in our sins. We were bound. We were dead. We were dead in trespasses. We were dead in sin but when you believed on Jesus hallelujah and when you believed on him guess what he that was dead will live again sins forgiven the power broke off the power of the grave the power of sin every person 
person that's born again has the testimony. He that was dead came forth again. Amen. Put your hands together and give God praise. Hallelujah, Hallelujah church. It's something to praise God for. He that was dead came forth. I want to tell you, there's nothing greater than that. Even when we were dead in sin and trespasses, how he's he quickened us together with Christ. For by grace are you saved. And he raised us up together. And he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Did you know that your spirit man is already sitting in heavenly places tonight? Hey Amen. This body hadn't checked out yet, but we are in heavenly places. We are walking with God. He that was dead came forth. It's a wonderful thing. It's a great testimony. Don't you know when the community heard that Lazarus was alive, don't you know they had to come see it for themselves? I got to see this with my own eyes. It shook the community. It shook Bethany. They had to see a man. I know I was at the funeral. What do you mean? He's up, he's up in a, in a going. No, I saw him. I saw him wrapped in the grave clothes. I saw him put in the grave. Oh no, they said he lives. He lives because Jesus called his name and he came forth. Hallelujah. Don't you know everybody had to come and see. Listen church, I want to tell you that we've got to come back to having a born again experience in the church again. This Christian evolution, this somehow you start doing traditions like we heard the testimony of. You start taking communion. You get a little water put on your head when you're a kid. That don't mean you're born of God. You have to come by faith to Jesus and believe on Him as a remedy of God. You don't evolve into Christianity. You're born into Christianity. You're born into this. And I don't mean a natural birth. I mean a spiritual birth. Amen. You're born of the Spirit. And if you're not, you're not in. It don't matter how many Bible lessons you had. It don't matter how much communion you took. It don't matter how many prayers you prayed. If you're not born into this kingdom of the Spirit of God, you're not in the kingdom. You can add knowledge. You can add, add rituals. You can add forms. But I want to tell you something. That gets the attention of no man. You don't come to church and all of a sudden start being like a Christian. You're either born in this or you're not in one of the other. There's no evolution in this. We are born into the kingdom of God by a spirit. And whenever a man's born again, people take notice. That's right. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I said they'll take notice. They'll know something's different about you. They don't have to worry about it. There's something different. Amen. You're different. I want to tell you something. It's a miraculous thing, folks. I know it's sometimes more evident for others. Some of us were a little more dead than others were dead. But either way, we're all were dead. But we've been born again. Such were some of you. But we've been washed and we've been cleansed and we've been renewed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But I want to tell you what, people, I began to get invitations to share my testimony at churches. I was already telling people around the community and my family. But then people wanted me to share it in the church because they couldn't believe that Jeremy Prohaska was born again. They couldn't believe that he that once persecuted, really I did it, but in my, it really I wasn't in, in that regard, like Paul, but that he preaches the faith that he was once against. I didn't preach against Christianity or persecute against it, but my, my lifestyle I sure did because I lived contrary to God's way and God's design and God's desire. And I knew I was living, fulfilling the lust of this old nature. But guess what? One day Jesus came into my heart and into my life. I was washed, cleansed, born of the Spirit. And people wanted to come and see with their own eyes how it was ever possible that he that 
once lived like I lived was now preaching the very against the very life that I once was a part of. Folks, who can do that? Only Jesus. It can do that in a split second. Make you against what you used to be for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Folks, we downplayed the born again experience. And we sold a cheap gospel just so we could get a few more people on the pew and try to ease our conscience believing that they're really saved when they're not saved because they added a little bit of Jesus to their life and they added a little bit of the lingo and they add a little bit of the forms of religion and we feel ourselves satisfied that maybe they're ready for heaven instead of saying no the cost is still the same if any man and come to me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Jesus didn't reduce the message to get the rich young ruler to follow him. He said, this is my demands. This is the cost. And if you're not willing to pay it, then I'll see you later. Praise God. <laughs> and he went away sorrowful, Brother Aaron. The modern church would have said, They'd have come up to you and they'd have said, Oh, wait a second. Jesus is too hard. Here, come to my church. Come to my church. We're not that hard. Come on, you can, you can keep all your stuff. You can keep, you can keep your drinking. You can keep your, you can keep your adultery. You can keep all that mess. Oh, you can, you can keep your country uh, music and all that. No, no, come on and come, come with us. Because if you hang around us long enough, maybe it'll rub off on you. That's not the way Jesus operated. No. Bible said that the man went away sorrowfully. And Jesus let him go. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Because he said, this is what are the demands. And if you can't meet them, then you can't be a part of this kingdom. You see, we, we downplayed the born again experience. But think about what that man missed out on. He's the only other one beside the 12 that Jesus said, come, follow me. He's the only one that got that invitation besides the 12. And look what God has done with those. Look what, that, look what he missed. Because he wanted to hold on to his covetous desires. And he couldn't imagine. But see, he didn't realize that what he would have gave up would have been nothing in comparison to what he would have attained. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. I want to tell you something, folks. You're not going to regret a mile. You're not going to regret a day. You're not going to regret a thing you ever gave for God. Oh, no, it's worth it all. I want to tell you, it's worth your life. It's worth everything. It's worth all your money. It's worth anything you have. It's worth your very life to follow Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you something. We need people to be born again in the house of God. Why? So we can let the community see one more time that Jesus and His blood and His Spirit really does transform hearts and lives. That it really does make a difference. That there really is a coming from death into life. And when you come from death to life, people know that, folks. <laughs> people know when a man was dead and made alive. That's right. It's an evidence. I want to tell you something. It is a wonderful thing to see he that was dead came forth. Hallelujah. What a, what a testimony. What a miracle. He, you know, there's no greater miracle than that. I want a cripples to walk too. I want cancer to fall off you too if you got it. But there ain't no greater miracle than God changing the nature of a corrupted human. If God can make a man love that hates, I tell you, only God can do that. Folks, that's a miracle. Yeah. Only God can change your desires. Only God can do that. Folks, that's a miracle. 
And that was the miracle of Lazarus. He that was dead came forth. That's the testimony of every single one of us in this place tonight that's really been born again. A man comes and he has life. He was dead, but now he's got life. And everybody around it knew that there was a difference. There was life where there previously wasn't life. It is an amazing thing. There's nothing more powerful than the born again experience. And I want to tell you something here tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you're really not born again. I want to tell you, I heard a story here just two weeks ago about a man who this person knew and he had grown up in the church. He had went to Bible college and was pastoring a church until one day he had a revelation that he never truly had been born again. And he was preaching the gospel, but he didn't have the gospel he preached. How's that possible? How is that even possible? She might be here tonight. Maybe you never came out of that grave. But I want to tell you something. It'd be the greatest decision you ever made. I said to you in John 5 and 25 that the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. So if you find yourself in that tomb tonight, I want to tell you that if you'll hear the voice of the Son of God, He'll call out your name. He'll let you know if you're right or not right. And if you're still buried in the tomb, I want to tell you that Jesus wants to call your name tonight. And if you'll hear his call, you'll live. They that are dead, when they hear the voice of God, they shall live. And God is calling out to those that are buried in the tomb. There's more holdings in the world than there are deep down looking for reality. And God knows how to make them to hear his voice even in the midst of their tomb he'll find a way for you to hear and if you hear you shall live Amen. hallelujah give God praise church thank you Lord God thank you. hallelujah I'm preaching better than you're shouting yes. that's a southern term I know but that's how we say it there I don't always say that but I just felt to say it there <laughs> Now, I'm not through yet. Say amen. Amen. As I'm really about to deal with this. Watch this. He that was dead came forth, comma, bound. I'm not taking anything away from the born again experience. I just preach that to you. But the Word of God tells us something here. Did you know every word matters? Yeah. Amen. There's something here. That's why I said you can't just read the Bible. You can't just look over it. you got to really read it. He that was dead came forth. And we just talked about how great of a miracle that was. But there is a continuation to the thought. Because he that was dead came forth bound, hand and foot, with Grave clothes. Listen to this. And his face was bound. So what do we have? We have a man that was dead coming back to life. So we have life. That's what Jesus brings to us, is it not? Verse 26 of John 5 says, For the Father has life in Himself, so has He given the Son to have life in Himself. John 1 and 4 says, In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. John 1, 5, 1 John 5 and 11 says, And this is the record, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Verse 12 says, He that hath the Son has life, and he that has not the Son has not, has not life. So the only thing alive in our world is that which is in Christ and that which Christ is in. And you can be breathing air and you can be eating food and you can be walking in this world and think that you have life, but you don't have life because only he that's in the Son has life. So if I'm not born into that, then I really don't have. I'm simply a man walking in the darkness. So we have life. A man comes back from the dead, he's alive. 
But what else do you have? Limitation. You have life with limitation. And that's where most of the church is. Folks, I'm an evangelist. I go all over this nation. If there's any truth I know to be reality because of personal experience and because of the people in places whom we minister. If there's anything that I have witnessed a great deal of, especially as of recently, it's people with life, but people with limitation. That means that they are not. They have life. They're born of God. They're living for Him, but they have limitation. There's still a touch on their life that speaks of the grave. He came with hand and foot bound with grave clothes. His face was bound about with a napkin. There was a limitation upon the life. And that's why Jesus said He wasn't planning on Him staying like that. He had life, but then He carried the thought on and He said, Loose him and let him go because my design is not just to have life my design is to have life more abundantly and that's exactly why I put John 10 and 10 right beside what we're preaching is because Jesus said I come that they might have life but that they might have it more abundantly you can have life but you can have it with limitation you can have life but not have more abundantly Abundant life. And that's where most of the church is. They're bound with limitations. They're still in their grave clothes. They're still wrapped up by the elements of the grave touch. But Jesus said, I don't want you to just have life. I want you to have abundant life. Come on, church. Listen, that word more abundantly means this. In the sense of beyond. Super abundant in quantity. Superior in quality. It, by implication, it means excessive. It means to be more abundant, to be exceedingly, very highly, beyond measure, more superfluous, more vehemently. I want to tell you something. When I read those words in the sense of beyond, that's what more abundantly just something leaped into my spirit. Have you ever just thought to yourself, has there ever been a sense in your life have you ever just had a sense that there's more than what you have? Have you ever had a sense that there's something beyond? There's something beyond where I'm at. There's something beyond what I have. I've got a sense that there's an abundance I can possess in Christ and I want to remove all the restrictions and the limitations off my life. Yes. Amen. Come on, church. Thank you, Jesus. I may not be talking to everybody tonight. At least I, I'm talking to everybody, but everybody won't hear. I want to tell somebody, God wants you to remove the limitations off of your life. Amen. He wants them off. Loose Him. Let Him go. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody right now. The Holy Ghost is preaching to you right now. And here's what he's saying. Loose him and let him go. And if you're true to what's on the inside, you might be feeling that something is trying to keep that oppressed. But there is something inside, deep within, that says, Preach, Brother Jeremy. Preach. I want the grave closed off. I want the limitations removed. Preach me out of this take off my limitations loose him come on somebody let him go it's time to stop living with the grave touch it's time to stop living just in life and it's time to access life more abundantly if you have a sense of beyond tonight Jesus wants you to unravel the grave clothes from your life Amen, bound. Bound. Life, but bound. How was he bound? He was bound in his hands. Bound in his hands. Hands are a means or an instrument 
of power. But hands also represent the ministry. Every time you see hands in the Word of God, I want you to think ministry. Because that's what hands are. Hands are ministry. You see, Jesus put forth His hands upon those that were oppressed of the devil. He put His hands on blind men and they received His sight. He put His hands on deaf ears and they opened. He put His hands on leprosy and they were healed. He put His hands on sinners and they came to God for forgiveness. He laid His hands on children and said, Let them come unto Me. He laid His hands upon the dead and they came back to life. Jesus laid his hands because he ministers through his hands. Amen. He put his hands on a woman that suffered for 18 years with an infirmity and she was made whole. It was with the hands that the apostles did mighty works. It was with Paul's hands that he said that he laid hands and worked the miracles of God. Hands are the ministry. And we all are called to ministry. Amen. I'm not talking about pulpits and platforms and positions. I'm talking about ministry. I'm talking about the ability to minister Jesus to a world that's hurting without Him. And I want to ask you, are you bound in ministry? Are you bound in ministry? I want to tell you, folks, I go a lot of places. And in the most southern Pentecostal environments, I know whatever kind of perception you got of what it's like in the churches there. I want to tell you that even there are people with limitation. Some people are so bound in their hands, they can't even lift them up to worship God. It doesn't matter what kind of, how you probe them, how you stir them. They're not going to lift their hands. You know why? Because they're bound in their hands. I told the story about a man that I know. He went to be with Jesus just a year ago. He was, a, he was in a wheelchair paralyzed from the neck down for 20 years. He was a, 40 years old when he fell from a ladder off a roof and broke his neck and lived. Couldn't move any part of his body from the neck down. But I want to tell you something about that man of God. He never missed a prayer meeting. He never missed a church service. He had to have round-the-clock care from nurses. They had to, in the middle of the service, I saw him on a number of times. They'd had to lift that wheelchair up. Took him four hours just to get ready to come to church. But they'd lift that wheelchair. They'd turn that thing back. He'd be totally upside down in the middle of the service just so the blood could rush back through his body. But you know what his testimony was? His testimony to his wife whenever he, before he went to be with Jesus was that he, the thing that he missed the most that he was looking forward to was lifting up his hands and Worshiping Jesus because he couldn't lift his hands. And people that claim to love Jesus with all their heart can't even lift their hands and worship. You know why? Because you're bound in hand. That's why. Because they're bound in their hands. Listen, how can you Fight the good fight of faith if you're bound in your hands. How can you pick up a sword of the Spirit if you're bound in your hands? How can you take up a shield of faith if you're bound in your hands? I want to tell you something, folks, you can't. And so many people are bound in their hand. They're limited in ministry. They can't minister Christ fully because they're bound in hand. I want to tell you that Lazarus was loosed and let go because the Bible says in chapter 12, verse number 9, that much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death because, watch this, because by reason of him many of the Jews went away and they believed on Jesus. That's a man that had his hands free because of his life. Many people we're leaving and believing on Jesus. That's hands that aren't bound, church. Praise God. It's good. 
And I had to say, God, am I bound in hand? Am I bound in hand? Can I be said of my life that many are coming to you because my hands are free? Because I'm not limited by the grave. Because there's something about my life that speaks of who you are. And men want to come see it. They want to just see him. They want to see you. <laughs> Paul said they glorified God in me. That's what he told the, the, uh, in the book of Romans. He said, they glorified God in me. They heard, he that once persecuted, now preached the gospel that he once persecuted. And they glorified God in me. You know what? They saw the hope that Jesus can change anybody. <laughs> he can change that man. He can change anybody. And that's what he did. Church, I got to move on, but I want to ask you something tonight. Are you bound in your hands? Are you bound in hand? Well, what about the feet? The feet represent progress. It represents mobility or movement, you could say. Listen, Jesus set us free so that we could walk in the newness of this life. We are called to walk with God. But how can I walk with God if I'm bound in foot? Let me ask you this. Can you really say concerning yourself, Brother Jeremy, there really is progression in my life. I really am moving forward with God. I really am. I'm not where I used to be with the Lord. I'm moving with Him. I'm progressing in faith. I'm progressing in spiritual maturity. I'm progressing in my walk. How can I run the race that's set before me if I'm wrapped up with my feet? How can I walk in newness of life if I'm bound in my foot? I can't, but Jesus said, loose Him and let Him go. He wants us to move from where we are and to greater experience, into greater revelation, into greater depth, into greater maturity. We're not even close where God had designed us ultimately to be. We'll never get there until we're in eternity with Him. And I come to tell you tonight, in a church that, not this church, but as a church world as a whole that is bound up, I want to tell you there is more tonight than what you have. You can grow and you can progress if you'll walk with God and you'll be loose from what's binding you up. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Folks, there's more than just getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's just the doorway. Right. Now you got to go through the door. <laughs> you got to get there. But don't stop there. I've seen people stop. They thought that's that, that was the goal. Once they got, that was the end. No, that's the doorway into all the realities of Jesus in a greater measure. But it could be said that there are people that are in the same place they are with God that they've been for years and years. And they sit on the church every single solitary week. They operate in ministry, but they're bound. What about the face? The face is vision. The face, because it covered the head, is understanding. How many of us are limited? How many of us can only see about this far in front of us as pertains to the realities of Jesus? Whenever we could move that hand and see the vast greatness of who He is. But how many just will never see beyond that far? Because they're bound with a napkin. Because they have limited sight. Listen, I want to tell you something tonight. This message, this word, was not just about Jesus to Lazarus. Remember I said how there's more, a lot of times we read, but we don't realize how much more that there is in one particular verse. Because that message continued on throughout the entirety of the epistles. It was the same message Paul preached to all of the churches. Did you know that 90% of the New Testament is written to Christians? Yeah. To Christians. 
When Paul writes in the epistles, it's the churches. It's the born-again people with limitations. Think about it. I'm not going to take all this time tonight. I'm just going to give you a highlight. I want to tell you that is a perpetual word that is still being spoken today. Life with limitation. Loose him and let him go. Was, was the church, I, I was trying to read over some of these this afternoon. And you just no more than open up in the book of Corinthians. Then what do you see? You see limitation on born again people. You see what the Bible calls the natural man. The natural man. By, it says that there are things that the eye hasn't seen or ear heard or entered the heart of men that God has reserved. He said that the Spirit searches out the deep things of God. And here's what he says. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. There's the limitation. The natural man is the limitation upon the new creature that lives on the side of us. There has to be an enlargement. Listen, folks. There has to be a growth to your revelation of Jesus. There has to be an enlargement to your spiritual man. He wants to grow. He wants to expand. And there's plenty of room for him to do it. But there's a limitation called the natural man that hindered this church and he said, I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but unto carnal, even as to babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither now are you able. It's not that he didn't want to give them meat. It was that he couldn't give them meat because they were restricted, because they were limited, because he said, I couldn't speak to you the spiritual things because you were not able to bear it. Amen. Folks, what if Jesus has so much more for you and me? I don't want to hear you weren't able to bear it. I don't want to hear you still had grave clothes. On your life. Jesus said to his disciples, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. It wasn't that he didn't have, he had many things to say, but he couldn't bear it now. Amen. Some of you can't bear it now, so I gotta quit. <laughs> you can't bear me preaching this long. Amen. I like to quit before the people do, so we better wrap this up. The limitation, folks. Bound in hand. Well, that's that. That's Corinth. What about what about Galatia? What was the grave clothes? What was the feet bound with? Was it not tradition? Was it not legalism? Was that not the limitation? How are you so soon removed, he said. Stand fast in the liberty, wherefore Christ has made you free. Amen. Don't be entangled again to a yoke of bondage. Take the grave clothes off. There's more. Well, that's Galatia. We could go further into that. What about Ephesus? That's the napkin. Listen to these words. I'm going to close here. He said, at the eyes of your understanding. I mean, just open the thing up right there. Just opened it up. This is one of the greatest books in the whole Bible, Ephesians. But look how, look, look how he opened it up. He opens it up telling them... The eyes of your understanding. He's praying for them. Okay? He's praying for them. What's he praying? 
for grave clothes to be loosed. What's he preaching? Loose him and let him go. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Who's he talking to? A church. Yeah. It's limited. Folks, how much are we not accessing? Because we cannot see what's really out there. Because we're still in grave clothes. We're still bound by the same old limitations. But here's what he prayed that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what is the riches of His glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is His exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. Think about it. He said to Colossians basically the same thing, that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and with wisdom and all spiritual understanding. Loose him. Just let him go. Just let, let him go. Let him grow. Let him, let him. That means stop standing in the way. Let him go. Why don't we just let God have his way in us? Why don't we just let Him unwrap the grave limitations from our life?